Hi YouTube, this is CinemaFan97 here, here, and today I am going to be talking about The Karate Kid Part 3. Now, recently I reviewed the first film, and while I was planning on reviewing the second film, I've decided that since Cobra Kai Season 4 is coming out tomorrow, oh, I figured it would be more timely if I talked about the third film, so I do plan on reviewing Karate Kid 2, who is sometime in January. And, uh, but before I start this video, I just want to mention that I sort of have a little bit of a history with this film. Because back in the day, I had a short-lived movie review series called Shitty Sequel Sunday, where I would review shitty sequels. And it only lasted three episodes. I did a couple episodes in, in, tw a couple episodes in 2016. I did one episode in 2019. Don't ask me why, why so many years apart, like, now, that's a topic for another video. You know, but, you know, like, here were the three films that I reviewed on that show. Episode 1, I ranted on Spider-Man 3. Episode 2, I ranted on this film. Um, and episode 3, I ran on Batman and Robin. So, I've decided, you know, like, since Cobra Kai Season 4 coming out, I've decided to revisit this film. And all I have to say is, while my hatred for this film isn't quite as strong as it was back then, I still think this movie is a piece of fucking garbage. Okay, now let's talk about the plot of the film. Okay, a Daniel and Miyagi have returned from Okinawa after the events of Part 2. And we also see John Kreese. So we, see, we find out what happened to him after the events of part two, you know, because, you know, the beginning of part two picked up right where part one left off and he choked Johnny in the parking lot and, and Daniel Miyagi stopped him. And now we find out that all of his students have left the Cobra Kai Dojo and which leaves him now he's broke. So he goes to who his, his Vietnam War buddy, Terry Silver, who is this rich, successful billionaire businessman, CEO of a company called Dynatox Industries, which is a toxic waste disposal company. And he tells him about what happened. Then Silver Bird decides to uh, conduct this huge revenge scheme on Daniel and Miyagi e, e to get back at him for like for like beating Crease, you know? And basically, like, his entire plan is basically based on luck, basically. Like, like, okay, step one is to get, is to find and, uh, a karate ka who can beat Daniel in the tournament. Step two is to make sure Daniel competes in the tournament. And step three is to get Daniel to train under him. Um... So, like, he could, like, make him darker, but it, it's just, it's like, it's not really cl clear what the whole end goal, what Terry Silver's end goal is, other than revenge. But, uh, more on that later. You know, okay, so when Daniel and Miyagi, when they get home, like, we see Daniel talking on the phone with his mother, and, and so Kumiko was supposedly going to come along with them. But that didn't happen. Like, Daniel explains to his mother, Oh, uh, she got uh, offered a dancing job in Tokyo, and she couldn't say no. Oh, I mean, now... Now, Kumiko's absence from this film used to really piss me off. Now, not as much. Because, you know, when I ran it on this film back in the day, that was before Cobra Kai came out. Out. Oh. And now we got Cobra Kai, and on that show, he's married to a woman named Amanda, and I love Amanda on Cobra Kai. So, Kumiko's absence doesn't really, really upset me that much anymore. But what does upset me about this film is Daniel getting friend-zoned. Owned. Owned. In this film, Daniel meets a girl named Jessica, and at first she she's thinking, oh, maybe, you know, because, like, we find out that her previous boyfriend cheated on her, but then later she decides, oh, oh, I'm going to be going back to Ohio soon, and me and my boy, 
that we talked and we're going to give it another go. It's like, this girl's an idiot. I'm like, he cheated on you. He doesn't deserve a second chance. I'm like, like the, the prince, you know what they say? Hey, fool you once, shame on him. Fool you twice, shame on you. Right? Well, I mean, actually it's fool me once, once shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But, but still, I mean, you get what I'm saying. And the reason why they did this is because is because when they cast Robin Lively, well, I've heard two different stories. Is that one is because Ralph didn't want to upset his wife. I'm sorry, I don't buy that. And the second explanation I've heard, which is a lot more plausible, is that Ralph Macchio was uncomfortable with, uh, you know, like kissing a minor. Because, you know, he was 27 when he did this film. Um, and she was like 16 going on 17. So... Um, so obviously like he felt uncomfortable, but I'm like, well then just get an older actress. Like I actually once listened to an interview of Robin Lively. Like if, if I can find it, I'll put a link in the description where she talks about, about how like she auditioned for Karate Kid 3 and one of like, like the people she was competing against for the role of Jessica was Heather Graham. I'm like, they should have gone with Heather Graham. I mean, she's a better actress than Robin Lively. Now, I, I don't hate Robin Lively as an actress, but in this film, she's just bland. Like, like she doesn't really have any purpose other than for Daniel to have someone to interact with and for, you know, oh, like Daniel to get mad at someone for, you know, harassing his girlfriend at the bar so he can punch him. So I'm like, that's really the only purpose this character serves in this movie. Like, I mean, also, her and Daniel don't really have that much chemistry. Yeah. I mean, like, for example, in the first film, Daniel and Allie had great chemistry. In the second film, one, in the second film Daniel and Kumiko had great chemistry. Like, in this film, like, they don't have that much chemistry. Yeah. You know? And I think the film, like, the fact they made their relationship platonic, I think the film suffers as a result because... I don't want to see my boy Daniel get friend zoned. I want to see him get the girl. Earl. Okay, um, now let's talk about Terry Silver. I'll be, okay, after watching this film again, I don't necessarily hate this character as much as I used to, but I'm still not the biggest fan of him. Um, I, I just find him way too over the top and campy. Like, that one scene, you know, when he's talking, looking to, uh, to Kreese on the phone, telling him about his master plan. Oh, I've already bought 20 new dojos. O's. You are back, my man. Bigger and badder than ever. Then Kreese tells him, make his knuckles bleed. He's like, ha, ha, ha. Oh, I like that. Oh, I want to use that. <laughs> it's just so cringeworthy. And face palming. Just, ugh. Like, like, when he does something like that, I, it's stupid. Now... Other scenes, I don't mind him. Like, when he's pretending to be a good guy, I I think he's okay. Like, when the scene when he tells uh, Daniel and Miyagi about what happened to Kreese, which we know is a lie, claiming that Kreese died of a heart attack, although that, that was not true. He, he comes off, he's, he's decent in that scene. And so, yeah, when he's acting like a friend to Daniel, I don't mind him. He even says some things that make me kind of laugh, like, like when he's when he's training Daniel, like he's telling him about Barney's going like he's a lean, mean fighting machine, ready to detach the head from the rest of your body. <laughs> okay, that was kind of funny, but a lot of the time he just is just so hamming it up way too much. It's like, dude, just just tone it down some. And like his character is also kind of an idiot too. Like, like I said, he buys like twenty new dojos for Crease. I'm like, Crease ran the sole Cobra Kai dojo into the ground. Now you want to give him 20 more? Or, I mean, plus, how could you find that many instructions, uh, I mean, instructors for like 20 new dojos, you know? It's like, you're basically trying to have Cobra Kai have a monopoly on karate in the valley. The, and, and here's another thing about that scene. The scene when he's talking to Kreese on the phone when Kreese is on vacation in Tahiti. Like, that's before Silver even meets Daniel and Miyagi. 
he has no idea. He shouldn't have any idea as to whether or not Miyagi is going to train Daniel. You know, like like for all he knew, Miyagi was training him already. Like I mean, a lot of his his whole plan is based on assumptions and luck. You know, and also um, let's talk about Mike Barnes. I mean, I'll give him the. I'll say this about Mike Barnes. He's a badass fighter, and he's and he's a tough cookie. I'll give him that. But there's not really that much to his character. Like, okay, he's in a magazine. He's, he's there's an article about him in Black Belt magazine. And so obviously he is very skilled. But we don't really know. We're not given enough backstory about him. Like, like uh, where's he from? Like, we just know he's not from the area. We don't know like what state or city is he from. Is he from? Uh, Washington and is he from is he from some other part of California it's like like where is this guy from it doesn't say and it's like also where are his parents like like he's going he's living at Silver's Mansion it's like sh like I'm assuming this kid's a minor it's like w are his parents really okay with this it's just, oh, another thing, like when he meets Silver, Silver is in a bubble bath. I am sorry. That is just so, oh, just weird watching a, a grown man while he's in a bubble bath uh, talking, talking to a teenage boy. I'm sorry. Did you really have to do that? It's just, it just gives me some pedo vibes there from Terry Silver, like, why not have it be at a dinner at a fancy restaurant? That would make sense. And, it's, and also, here's another thing about Silver that's weird. He doesn't ever disguise himself when he's like, you know, out and about, like pretending to be a good guy. I mean, I mean, this guy is supposedly like a successful billionaire businessman, and and yet nobody recognizes him. I'm like. He should be a household name. He should be, like, super famous. Like, he should be, like, Ted Turner-level famous or Hugh Hefner-level famous. Yet, nobody recognizes him. Like, why doesn't he just... Why doesn't he wear a disguise and use an alias? It's, it's like... Like, people should know this guy. And also, like, the business, it's like, oh, he's a toxic waste disposal company. He, he dumps toxic waste in third world countries. And he bribes... I the courts into letting him off scot free. It's like, it's like what the hell? It's like really that's what you come up with. Like why not? Like instead of that, why not make him like a mag, a editor in chief of a magazine? Like let's say of like a supermodel magazine, like Sports Illustrated. Like I'm not. I mean, obviously you can't make him like Hugh Hefner, or like Playboy, because you know it's a PG movie. But make him like. Like head of like a Sports Illustrated type magazine, that would be that would be better. It's, I mean, because then like it's less obvious that this guy's evil, you know. Oh, and also, Thomasine Griffith, like he he looks too young to be a Vietnam veteran in the year nineteen eighty five. I've it's it's like I think they sh they should have gotten an older actor for this role, like. Although, he does look older than Daniel, so, and he does look older than he actually is, so I guess maybe I, I could, my, I don't know, but even then, I do think they could have used someone who's a little bit older, like, this, Terry Silver seems like a role that Brad Dourif could have played well, like, I don't know if Brad Dourif auditioned for this, probably not, I don't know, I can't find any information online as to who else was considered for the role of Terry Silver, but Brad Dourif, I think, would have been an interesting choice for this role. So, um, yeah, okay, and, uh, also, like, I'm not a fan of Sean Kanan's performance as Mike Barnes, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just, I just hate his voice, like, I find his voice annoying, I mean, there are some scenes where I don't mind him, I mean, he does do well in the scene when he's talking to Silver about, you know, the dojos, those, but about, you know, like, how he wants, how Silver offers him 25%, but 
Barnes requests 50% ownership of the new dojos. O's. And uh, at first, you know, I don't think I, Terry's like, I can't afford more than 35. And Barnes like, it was nice to meet everyone. And then he goes, hey, five is hard to negotiate? Harder. And you got your 50%. It's like, Sean Kane's fine in that scene, and he does have some, um, he has a couple of lines I like, like when, you know, when, when Silver, when, when him and Silver have that fake fight, when Silver's coming to Daniel's rescue, you know, he's like, who are you, his mother? I'm like, okay, that was kind of funny, and I like the line where he's like, what's the matter, sweetheart? Having trouble breathing? Okay, so, he does have a few, a couple lines I like, but honestly, that's it, like, Again, there's not really much to this character. Okay, he's a badass fighter, fighter, and he's very loud and obnoxious. There's not really much to him. He just doesn't have the finesse that Johnny had, and he doesn't have the finesse that Chosen had either. There, you know? Oh, and, uh... Now, I'm going to go oh, to say, like, what my biggest problem with this film is, it is the way this film handles the character of Daniel LaRusso. Oh my god. God. It, they fucking really dropped the ball here. Like, you know, the first movie, you know, first movie, he's a wimp, he doesn't know that much karate, then he gets bullied, then he gets Mr. Miyagi he, to train him and teach him and train him for the All Valley Tournament. Then he enters the tournament and he and he kicks ass and wins. Second movie goes to Okinawa with Miyagi, gets into like a into a feud with Chosen, then fights Chosen to death, whoops his ass. And you think that this movie, okay, you know, be him kicking some more ass. No, instead we get oh he's an even he's an even bigger wimp than he was in the first movie. The like every time Barnes and Daniel fight, Barnes absolutely kicks the shit out. He dominates him. He makes him his bitch throughout this entire movie. And it's depressing to watch. I mean, Daniel, he's at his weakest in this film when he should be at his strongest. Now, I'm not saying that Daniel should easily steamroll Barnes. I mean, he is a tough cookie. He's a really skilled fighter. I mean, if you're in if you're in a Black Belt Magazine article, you're very skilled. So I, I could buy Barnes giving him some trouble, but I don't see him just getting his ass handed to him I'm on a silver platter by this guy, and I definitely don't see Daniel being scared shitless to fight him. Um, especially after he fought Chosen in a death match. And I'm sorry, I, I think Chosen would beat Mike Barnes in a fight. Now, it wouldn't be like, it wouldn't be like, like a steamroll, but I think it would be a pretty, pretty good fight. But at the end, I think Chosen would come out on top because I, I just don't think Mike Barnes is the type of guy who'd have the endurance to fight someone to the death. That's just not his territory. He, like now, I think Barnes would would beat Johnny, would have beaten Johnny fight, no question about that. But Chosen, no, I, I I think Chosen would beat Barnes. I mean, Chosen was trying to kill Daniel. He was a trained killer. He was a psycho. Oh, he held a knife to Kumiko's throat. I mean, the worst thing, like, this guy does is, like, oh, he holds Daniel and Jessica over a cliff and threatens to, like, drop them if, if Daniel doesn't sign. I mean, the, uh, doesn't sign the application. So, um... And also, like, okay, this film does have some interesting ideas. You know, like, Kree's trying to... Kree's getting revenge? That's actually a really interesting idea for a Karate Kid sequel. But it was done so poorly. And also, you know, like, Daniel and Miyagi having a falling out. Um, that, that's, that's an interesting idea in and of itself, but it was done so poorly. Like, now, at, at the beginning, it made sense why Miyagi would be against training Daniel for this tournament. But... But after, you know, oh, Barnes and his and his accomplices stole the bonsai tree, like, that should have been the last draw for Miyagi. That should have been like, okay, fine, Daniel son, I'll train you. I mean, and, but Miyagi, he doesn't care that his bonsai trees get stolen. When? It's like, dude, you're supposed to love those trees. Like, why aren't you more outraged? Instead, he's, he's just going fishing.
Like, I mean... You know, and you didn't even have to use the tournament route again. I mean, there's many different ways Kreese could get revenge. I mean... I mean, there's so many different ways you could have done this film, but... I mean, this film, it just comes off as a pale, pale imitation of the first movie. And uh, also, uh, the, like, the Bonsai Tree Store thing, that was so stupid. Like, like, Daniel blows off all his college money just so he can open up a tree store for Mish Miyagi, when, even after Miyagi told no. I'm like, wow. How stupid. I mean, really? I mean, we don't see people flock into this bonsai tree store. I mean, you know? Like, why open up a tree store that no one's going to go to? It's like, a better idea for Daniel was for like, how about, let's say they open up a, a Japanese restaurant on, and maybe they could have bonsai trees on display there. And maybe even customers could, you know, every customer could, could take one home. Just like, you know, like, like you know how like a, 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 a toy comes home with every Happy Meal? It could be like that. But no, let's open up some bonsai store that no one's going to go to. Yeah, like, blow all your college tuition money just to open up a tree store. Trust me, you'll never regret it. But, you know, it's just... I mean, Daniel, I mean, he's... I mean, in Cobra Kai, Daniel's now the successful rich car dealer. But when you think about, like... At the beginning of Cobra Kai, how Johnny's just this uh, down on his luck, deadbeat loser who can't hold a job and lives in a crappy apartment in Reseda. Like, when you look, when you think about it, that could have easily been Daniel. Like, Daniel could have easily ended up just like Johnny. I mean, I, I think that a lot of people, I don't know how many people realize that, but, you know, oh, um, Yeah, I mean, yeah, and also like, like Terry Silver, the whole Quicksilver method thing. It's like, okay, Terry, are are you trying? Okay, now the Quicksilver method, it's kind of interesting, you know, like man can't stand, he can't fight, a man can't breathe, he can't fight, a man can't see can't fight okay that sounds like that could be something good in, in a in a street fight but i mean like if you try that stuff in a tournament they'll get you disqualified it's like like what's his goal is he teaching daniel moves that would get him disqualified because daniel knows he wouldn't be able to use it and he'd be pretty much defenseless in the tournament or is he or does he want daniel to get disqualified it's like what's his goal here here and and I think, like, when Daniel and Jessica, when they're at the bar, and and uh, and Je and then like Silver bribes that guy into uh, harassing Daniel and Jessica, then like Daniel punches the guy. I mean, I'm sorry, it didn't really come off as that bad. Yeah, he broke his nose, but the guy was was being was being a dick, and he was harassing Jessica. I mean. I mean, is it really surprising that Daniel would would defend her? I mean, I think it would make more sense, like, let's say, instead of just Daniel just punching the guy in the face, breaking nose, if he just started punching him, then just kept punching him and punching him until he didn't have to, just started wailing on him. Okay, that would make more sense. Okay, then, yeah, we show Daniel's kind of going to the dark side. But I'm sorry, this just came off as lame. And, and, and uh, this is getting pretty long. Like I, I'm gonna. Uh, this is gonna be a two-part video. So, yeah, I'll make a uh, part two in just a second. Hold on.